are you doing here? You're not even in this movie. That, that was a slip of the... It, 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 never mind. I, I review Halloween for you. You're not in it. Goodbye. Worldwide Web, I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality of the best hair, and welcome back to... The Summer of Halloween! <sighs> Which, as some of you have noted, would probably roll off the tongue a little better if it was called... The Summer of Michael Myers! But then, of course, we run into the slight problem that is Halloween 3. Subtitled Season of the Witch, Halloween 3 was John Carpenter's attempt to switch up the Halloween series from being a slasher villain single machine into being more of an anthology series of various tales of horror linked not by characters or locations, but rather their relation to the night of Halloween. And of course, for taking such a daring risk with this entry, it's considered one of the worst movies ever made. Roger Ebert, who gave the original four out of four stars, put this on his most hated movies list. And people swear up and down, it's not just because it's a Halloween movie that doesn't have Michael Myers in it. It really is just that bad in its own right. But, oh, what the hell is movie even about? Halloween 3 follows Daniel Callis, played by Tom Atkins, after a seemingly random encounter thrusts him into a world of murder, mystery, and dark magic. It's almost Halloween, and every kid in America simply must have one of those Silver Shamrock Halloween masks. But the secretive Silver Shamrock Company may not be trying to spread joy or make money, but cause horrifying death on an unimaginable scale. Maybe. I mean, they're kind of secretive about it. But anyway, let's take a look at Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and... I don't know, judge it on its own merits, maybe? Or I have to compare it to the rest of the series right away, because that iconic music is uh, completely absent as well. Replaced by something that sounds like short circuit if Johnny Five wasn't struck by lightning, but rather possessed by Satan. But they can still change up the music and make it sound plenty like Halloween. For instance... That out of the way, the two inches from the TV point of view does eventually back away and reveal what we all could have guessed before even turning the movie on. A jack-o'-lantern! And then it starts flashing faster and faster, just to say fuck you to all epileptics out there, I guess. Thus, we can finally start the movie proper, this time traveling to the strange, faraway lands of Northern California. It seems Harry Grimbridge, played by Al Berry, is trying to escape from a car that is following him. Somehow he thinks the best way to do this is to stick to the roads, running into a parking lot that the vehicle can easily fit in. However, the doors are all locked, and while the car does pass by, they figure out, hey, wait a minute, this thing has reverse gear, let's put it to good use. The man in the suit, he has returned. The man in the suit, he hasn't learned. The man in the suit, he will not leave. The man in the suit will make you bleed. It would seem Alfalfa here is a lot stronger than he looks, easily overpowering Harry. But that's nothing a handed any all-American automobile can't fix. This gives Harry the chance to escape, and then we hear on the news... The blue stone was one of 19, believed to represent the 19-year cycle of the moon. It weighs more than five tons, making its disappearance a mystery indeed. Someone just so happened to steal a block of Stonehenge without anyone even noticing. Damn you, David Copperfield. As it turns out, this TV is in a gas station being manned by Walter Jones, played by S.X. Smith. As a Silver Shamrock Halloween mask commercial plays, suddenly Harry barges in with a jump scare and a spooky message. They're coming. They're coming. Okay, I've got two seconds to tell them about this evil plot that's unfolding before my very eyes... Now what the hell, let's be about as descriptive as a general UPS delivery estimate. Ah well, onto the real star of the show, Dr. Callis, coming over to spend time with his kids and ex-wife Linda, played by Nancy Kez. His children probably aren't going to like him much after tonight either, because his surprising them with Halloween masks is pointless considering Mommy already got them those oh-so-popular silver shamrock masks from the commercials. The commercials that play over and over and over again. In four days to Halloween, turn that down. In four days to Halloween, silver. Yeah, this is Chalice. That song will get in your head. That's the point. It's an ad. It adds to the sense of dread. Horror movie. And 
darn it, Danny's been called back into work. Seems his hospital staffed about as well as the last one we saw. The point is, Harry has been brought in, and this doctor is the only one who can be counted on to help him. Or at least be there as he comes to and gives him a tracking update on those upcoming plot points. They're going to kill us. All of us. All of us. And that is my cue to get the fuck up out of here. So Harry's going to be taken care of overnight by Dr. Callis and Nurse Agnes, played by Maidie Norman. Should be fine. They seem to get along okay. I think I should have married you, Agnes. <laughs> Watch it, Buster. I play for keeps, you know. I'm serious. <laughs> Such behavior shall not be tolerated in current year. Anyway, the good doctor's care seems to mean that instead of sleeping at home, he sleeps on a hospital couch. That way, there's nobody to notice when the hitman in a suit makes his way to Harry's room and makes sure the body count rises. Huh. Anyone else think that he looks kind of like the old man Halloween mask now? Or is it just the latex gore effects? Our snappy slaughterer isn't quite as concerned with getting out undetected, but then again it's a horror movie, and as he's a bad guy, a light stroll is all he needs to do to accomplish anything, allowing him to reach his car unchallenged. However... <laughs> I usually don't feel like doing that unless I'm just arriving at work. This turn of events means the police show up, and the good doctor now has to call his ex-wife to reschedule when he can see their kids. Not that she's letting him off the hook that easy. I really gotta go. Seriously, I drank way too much coffee and I think I'm about to explode. The mystery deepens when Daniel realizes that the old man was clutching a mask. A silver shamrock mask! Ah, oh, well, let's ignore that for now and skip to the morning, where the dead man's daughter comes in to identify the body. Ellie, played by Stacy Nelkin. Her being so confused and distraught does get to our good doctor, of course. Should I ask her out now, or wait until the smell of a dead guy dissipates? First things first, we have to introduce another character, the assistant coroner, Teddy, played by Wendy Westberg. Dr. Callis doesn't like this situation. It's too weird having some well-dressed nutcase come in, rip a man's skull in half, and follow that up with suicide. Teddy doesn't have the biggest sway, but she says she'll help. After all, she's helped the good doctor in more ways than people realize. Thanks again. Okay, uh, Dr. Bornstash, do you just work your way through every woman you meet? Speaking of meeting women, Dr. Callis goes to the bar! The bar with, like, one patron. Him. And a TV, I guess. Come on, come on, come on. What's the matter? Well, for one thing, almost no other commercial ever even plays. Silver Shamrock ads are annoying as piss, and it seems like they bought up all the ad space in October. But who would happen to show up but Ellie? Oh, that was easy. One of the nurses told me I could find you here. His desires to get drunk and have sex with every woman he meets is well documented. I saw you at the funeral. Thank you. I'm glad you did, because we didn't. For all I know, they left your father in a ditch behind the hospital. She's here because she wants to know if her dad maybe might have exposited some plot-relevant shit before he died, but Dr. Pornstash over here makes like all the guy did was say some pretty shit about how much he loves his daughter. Thank you, anyway. Wait a second. We haven't had sex yet, and I don't intend to let my streak end now. Seeing as meaningless compliments aren't getting him any closer to Bone Town, Dr. Callis tells her the truth. Her father had a Halloween mask and said they're gonna kill us all! Fortunately, this does lead somewhere. Not the bedroom Daniel wanted, but Harry's toy store. The mask is the big clue, as he has been selling the silver shamrock masks, and his ledger should provide some clue as to what he was doing shortly before he died. I think my father ran into trouble somewhere between here and Santa Mira. Santa Mira? Where they make those? American manufacturing? Oh, that is weird. With one more clue in their repertoire, and a location to check, there's only one thing left to do now. Linda, I can't get out of it. I'm really sorry. I... Ah, just a bunch of doctors talking about boring stuff. Muscle relaxant administration. Physical therapy. Doctor patient confidentiality. The ex and kids off his back for the next few days, he grabs the beer and runs off with his new 20-something friend for a road trip. Also... Two more days to Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. 
two more days to Halloween, Silver Shamrock. Just so you know, that shit's happening, like, constantly. I am not going to stop for every single instance. In fact, I think I already skipped over some. As local as the Silver Shamrock Factory is, it's still in the middle of nowhere, and we have plenty of time to go over the history of the town. It seems it's an Irish settlement, and the Silver Shamrock headquarters used to be an old dairy farm. That's all well and good, but they still don't exactly know what the hell they're doing here. I'm not ready for this. We need a plan. Okay, how about this? We pose as the FTC, giving the Silver Shamrock Factory a surprise inspection, and then we get arrested for impersonating federal officers. Rather, his plan is they double back to the motel. For any information they might have, of course. Not by asking the motel technician, played by Jeffrey D. Henry, but by renting a room before Dr. Callis secretly runs off to rummage through the sign-in book finding out Harry did, in fact, check in on the 20th. Now that this has been established... Daddy! Watch his writing, honey! You could've killed that man! I didn't hurt him! We have to hurry up and introduce the rest of the characters before the two we care about close the door on these assholes. This would be Buddy Kupfer, played by Ralph Strait, his wife Betty, played by Jadine Barbour, and the snot-nosed little brat Little Buddy, played by Brad Schachter. Don't you dare go in the street! Do you hear me? Ha! <laughs> that showed her. Talk to the hand. The back of the hand. One more character to introduce who also almost runs the doctor over. Marge Gutman, played by Garn Stevens. Got their orders all screwed up, now have to stay in this dump again. I haven't had sex with her yet. This does complicate things. Ah, oh, well, he has the information he needed to prove Henry did come to town, and Ellie thinks they need to head back to the factory right away! Whoa, we'll hold exactly on, slow the... down, slow down. It's getting late. I could use a drink. Let's take our time. Relax, take a load off, grab a few beers, invite Marge over for a threesome. Actually, yes, their awkward conversation does go straight to the topic of fucking, and that's all it takes for Dr. Pornstash to begin the operation. Also, a good thing they have a bed, because Jamie Lee Curtis goes over to the town's loudspeakers to deliver an important message. It's six o'clock. Curfew. Curfew. All residents of Santa Mira, please clear the street. Six o'clock curfew? And the hell's it lifted? Noon? Or in five minutes, because while we watch every house lock up and everyone go inside, not only does this so-called curfew not stop Daniel from going outside anyway, the liquor store is still open! Kinda of hard to explain how the hell that operates if there's a curfew here. Either way, the doctor heads back to the motel through the always safe and secure dark alleyways. Whoa! Oh, jeez! Mr. 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 Didn't mean to scare ya. Don't worry, you didn't. Even if jump scares work on you, it doesn't really scare you, it just startles you. The homeless man would be Starker, played by Jonathan Terry. This means he's a local, and for the low, low price of some spare change and a little alcohol, Callus can drill the man for information. As it turns out, the CEO of Silver Shamrock, Connell Cochran, didn't even hire anyone local to run the factory, bringing all his workers from somewhere else. And even worse, he's set up surveillance all around town. So you have to be careful what you say no matter where you are. Hey, Cochran! Fuck you! Yeah, that'll show him. Before that, he might have been under the false impression of the man whose life he ruined, who now has to resort to bumming alcohol off his strangers in the middle of the night during a curfew, just might have actually liked the guy. Starker goes on to say there's strange rumors about what goes on in the factory, but when Daniel asks him to elaborate, he just goes off talking about how he's gonna get some Maltovs and burn the place to the ground! Problem with that plan is we then spend the next couple of minutes watching him go off on his own to make a spray cheese sandwich, so it's no surprise when Cochran's clan comes to kill. Now I think I remember seeing better gore effects from Cinemassacre circa 2008. So much for his Maltov plan, then. March, however, plans to pick up her order of masks and complains about as much as she can while she's at it. The merchandise is slipping. I mean, my four-year-old was throwing the thing against the wall. Granted, the trademark shouldn't just come right off. Yeah, I see what you mean. Why not? Do people not remove tags from their clothing in this universe? The trademark is more than it seems, though, as although Marge has been lugging it around for quite some time, it takes dropping it upside down for her to notice that it, in fact, has a second side. Even stranger, that side has some mysterious circuitry. So, using a handy-dandy bobby pin... What's that? 
death by 80s laser special effects. Which isn't as cut and dry and clean as you might think. Personally, I find the actual real bug crawling around the most unsettling part of this. But that's just me. Either way, Dr. Pornstash doesn't let this little incident interrupt his fucking, and it's not until quite a while later that a mysterious group of men arrive to take her away. To the Silver Shamrock headquarters of all places. Don't worry though, Cochran, played by Dan O'Herlihy, arrives shortly after to explain away the situation. It's all over, my friends. Just a small accident. The lady's going to get the very best possible treatment, I promise you that. I'm not sure people in general use that term to describe cremation. While Callus is a doctor, they swear she'll get the best treatment possible down at Silver Shamrock HQ. But if you listen, you hear the man say that it was what he calls a misfire. They figure things are way more crazy than either of them could have expected. But they can't quit now. There's a mystery to solve! With that in mind, come morning, Daniel calls Teddy to find out if there's anything new about the autopsy results. Thing is, she's been tasked with car debris, but even that is very strange indeed. Well, that was a hot fire, but there would have to be some bone fragments or teeth or something. I've got nothing here to indicate there was ever a body at all. Just ashes and car parts. How about you? Well, I got drunk and fucked the shit out of my co-star. But the other woman I met is already dead, so... Hmm. Anyway, Denny and Ellie make it to the Silver Shamrock factory, but it turns out Ellie's father, in fact, already came up to pick up the order! which I kind of figured he did, but before they can leave, defeated with no new leads, who should happen to show up but the Cooper family? They're here to meet up with the big man in charge, Mr. Cochran, because Buddy just so happened to sell the most silver shamrock masks of all. This means they get a free tour of the factory! Yay? And as for my other friends, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Smith, of course. Ah, oh, come on, you two look nothing like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Mr. Cochran offers to take the two of them along for the grand tour, and why not reimburse them for their mask order to boot? That way, we can get more exposition on the backstory of the Silver Shamrock Company. Seems the toy maker has a long history of making intricate mechanical gadgets to spread joy throughout the world. Joy to snot-nosed little shits like Buddy, who just wants to know what he can take from the tour. I want that one! Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, look over here. Those masks haven't been through final processing. They've been stuck at 95% for days now. The final processing in question takes place in the clearly marked final processing room, but that's a little too much exposition for now, so Cochran finishes off the tour here. However, when Daniel and Ellie head out, Ellie spots her father's station wagon! Of course, the well-dressed and very quiet resistance they receive is enough to get them to back off. With that in mind, they decide to get the hell out of there and call the police right away. And by that, I mean return to the motel and wait until night so that Daniel can leave Ellie all alone and try to use the phone in the motel office, which only connects him to operator Jamie Lee Curtis, telling him he can't connect to anyone anyway. And of course, by the time he gets back, Ellie is missing. The man of the suit, he's in a click. The man of the suit for treats and tricks. The man of the suit kidnapped your screw. The man of the suit, he's after you. Five guys isn't going to be enough to stop Dr. Pornstash, though, and he escapes into the night. After finding out the phones in town won't let him call anyone, again, he eventually makes it back to the Silver Shamrock headquarters, certain that Ellie was taken here, and any random asshole he finds must be in on it. Where is she? Where is she? Where is she? We've seen skulls ripped in half by hand, suicide by gasoline, decapitation by hand, and laser death into the mouth. Robo Granny here really isn't that surprising anymore, Danny boy. His screaming gets the attention of a spare goon, though, and they fight. As it turns out, the man in the suit can take a punch, but he can't handle all Dr. Callis has to offer once the man gets on top. suit has yellow blood. I... That's kind of familiar, isn't it? Also, turns out the guy's a motherfucking Terminator. That's kind of an important detail. And while Daniel can take one out, now he's kind of tired. And two? Well, that's not even worth putting up a struggle for. Thus, he is easily captured. And Cochran shows up to give more exposition. It didn't take you long to get here, Mr. Chellis. Dr. Chellis, I should say. It turns out Cochran knew that he and Mrs. Smith weren't who they said they were, and he just went and played along with it because he likes fucking with people. 
Seriously, they established the man invented sticky toilet paper, so yeah. Thus everything comes together on October 31st. Halloween. Hey, how about that? Also, the reason all of Cochrane's cohorts behave so robotically is because they're all robots. He designed them himself, what with his skills as a toy maker. Think of it like small soldiers, only they're not small, and he worked extra hard to make their exteriors super realistic. Bless you. Convincing, aren't they? Now, for fuck's sake, plenty of people out there think that Mark Zuckerberg's a robot, and there's only a 40% chance that's actually true. Like any good supervillain, Cochrane decides not to kill Daniel right away, but rather bring him into his super-secret lab and explain in painstaking detail his evil plans. First of all, the final processing room just so happens to be where they've been keeping the stolen block of Stonehenge this whole time! We had a time getting it here. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how we did it. So we're not even going to try to explain it. My money's on aliens. At this point, would that really be so outlandish? This particular stone is important because it just so happens to hold an incredible power. One that even if broken down into Sandhenge is still more than capable of killing. On that note, look! Ellie is safe and sound, strapped to a gurney. Not to worry, they won't be killing her. They'll show off the power of classic rock with the handy-dandy Kupfer family. Seems Cochrane hasn't let them leave in all this time, but it's fine. Buddy thinks they're just going to give their opinions on some new Silver Shamrock commercials, and then they can go free. All you lucky kids with Silver Shamrock masks, gather round your TV set, put on your masks, and watch. Wait, 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 wait. Is his entire evil plan dependent on children doing what they're told? Good luck with that one, dumbass. In a majorly strong stretch of my suspension of disbelief, Little Buddy follows the instructions to a T, and before long, Jacko Seizure pops up, and the Silver Shamrock trademark is activated by the power of Stonehenge. The kid's horribly killed from the inside out! Masses of bugs escape his desiccated corpse, and even snakes. Mrs. Cooper just died of fear, I think? But Buddy dodges the grass snake, only to be bitten by the rattlesnake, killing him too. Thus, the entire Kupfer family is dead. Soon enough, it will be every child in the nation. As we see, the annoying as piss Silver Shamrock commercials were so effective, damn near every kid is one of those three Silver Shamrock masks for Halloween. Sounds like a really fucking bad Halloween, if you ask me. And the things were advertised as glow-in-the-dark, which they obviously aren't. If someone doesn't call the Better Business Bureau over this, I just don't know anymore. Teddy, however, has just figured out that the reason she can't find bone or teeth in the car is because the man was, in fact, a robot. Oh, well, I guess that means she gotta die, too. <laughs> Though somehow I feel like this revelation should have come at a earlier point in the movie, before we already knew for a fact that they, yes, 100% are robots, and also back when maybe knowing this would have helped at all. Because it's already Halloween night and Dr. Callis is trying to get what exposition he can before they off him. Why, Cochran? Why? Do I need a reason? It helps! You know, wake up, brush your teeth, have some lucky charms, murder every child in America. It just doesn't flow right with normal day-to-day -day activities. He does get into detail, but it requires even more backstory. You see, he's Irish, and way back when, a few millennia ago, Halloween was something very different in the old country. The Festival of Samhain. Hey, pronounced it right. Now comes the explanation. Blink and you'll miss it. The old ways of witchcraft demanded blood sacrifices, animals, and even children. However, haven't done that in a few thousand years because the planets weren't in the right position. This year, though? They're in alignment. And it's time again. The world's going to change tonight, Doctor. How? Can I get the patch notes here? Nah, Dr. Callis just has to wait to be sacrificed along with the others in the broadcast commercial of death coming up after tonight's showing of Halloween. But, oh, God, no. There's no way in hell you're going to strap me to a chair and force me to watch Halloween again. Thus, destroying the television, he gets the glass shards he needs to cut away at his binds. 
No idea how he reached them, but that doesn't matter. With ninja precision, he uses the mask to block the camera feed and escapes into the ventilation system. He then makes a call to his ex-wife, trying to get her to make sure that their children aren't horribly killed tonight. Which goes about as well as when I cite fair use in a DMCA counter notification. Go to hell! <laughs> well, that was a, about as effective as a tissue paper trampoline. With his kids most likely dead, he heads off to save Ellie. However, he's not done trying to save Halloween yet. The two of them sneak back into the final processing area, where teams are still hard at work chipping away at Stonehenge, because, hey, there's like an hour until the commercial airs. Surely that's enough time to ship and sell a few more masks, right? Dr. Pornstash, however, remembers the code to get that commercial running on their TVs and using that. Plus a handy-dandy whole fucking case of Stonehenge-infused silver shamrock tags, he rains death on the robotic servants below. Cochran does see him, but he's so impressed with the man killing everything that stands in his way, he simply applauds the guy. Ah, so that's how it feels to chew five gum. With that, Stonehenge explodes! The computers explode! The masks explode! The factory explodes! But Dr. Pornstash escapes into the night, driving back to the big city with Ellie, in the hopes of stopping the broadcast before it's too late. Except Ellie seems... different. Ellie! I like you, but this is no time to play gotcha nose! Fortunately, she helps him use a local tree to stop the vehicle, but then it's revealed that she is, in fact, one of Cochrane's robots! Ah, oh, that's nothing a handy-dandy decapitation can't solve. Or is it? The dismembered hand chokes Daniel, and he fights it off. But then Ellie's headless body attacks again! Okay, screw it, may as well just run back to town. Well, except for the fact that this took a really fucking long time to do, and now Daniel's got... Ooh, uh, about 30 seconds to get the networks not to air the commercial, or else. You know, uh, all the children all over the country are gonna fucking die in horrible ways. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! What do you want, man? Some of us live on ad revenue. Also, it wasn't originally quite as ambiguous as to whether or not he succeeded in getting them to turn the commercial off, as they originally didn't plan to have credits music here, just the endless screams of dying children. So, yay. Anyway, that was Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Also known as one of the greatest movies ever made or that ever could be made. Season of the Witch is a masterwork in the most literal sense of the term. The angles, aesthetic, and acting all come together to create a true horror legend that will go down in history as the best one even possible. Don't even bother making any more horror movies. You can't top Season of the Witch. It easily comes in at five exploding silver shamrock trademarks of death out of five. Consider that a uh, producer's cut ending. On with the final version of the final verdict. Halloween 3 tried something different, and for that it shouldn't be any surprise that fans of Halloween weren't too pleased with it. However, judging it by its own merits, it's not nearly the train wreck it's been made out to be. Yes, the gore effects aren't the best, and the curfew that isn't makes no damn sense, but there's one thing this movie has going in spades. Dread. From the get-go, there's a definite feeling of unease permeating the scenes, characters fleeing from horrors we know little about, and events transpiring that leave enough questions in their wake to keep you guessing. Unless you just watched a YouTube video spoiling it all, I guess. Uh, sorry about that. In a way, I feel like this movie had a similar feeling going through it as another Carpenter flick, Prince of Darkness. A sense of dread that slowly builds as the body count ticks ever higher, and every answer brings with it two more questions. Of course, I hear not many people liked Prince of Darkness either, so yeah. No matter the case, it goes without saying that Halloween 3 is its own damn movie and doesn't fit the greater Michael Myers mythos at all. People told me Friday the 13th Part 5 wasn't really a Friday the 13th because no Jason, but that one had far more in common with the rest of the series than Halloween 3 does Halloween. At the end of the day, Halloween 3 is a decent horror flick. The gore could be better, some scenes feel pointless, and the Big Bad's motivations of my horror scope today is commit mass murder might be less believable than his robot minions, but it's got what I always look for in my horror movies, dread, and comes in at a strong three hot sexy sidekicks who may or may not have been a sex robot the entire time. Out of five. It's either that, or they killed her and then made a robot version of her at that point, and... I don't know, which timeline do you find more disturbing? 
Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, 100 days till Halloween, 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 100 days till Halloween, Silver Shamrock.